Hi, I am Glenda Probst from Nanny Transitions, and I am here today with Becky Cavanaugh, and together we are going to present the Nanny Transitions workshop. If you're on the Nanny Transitions page, you've probably heard a lot about the Nanny Transitions workshop. Maybe some of you have attended the Nanny Transitions workshop at one of the NNTD, NNTD events, or I've done it with um, Martha over at Chronicles of Narnia. Um, there's several places online that is, but today, Becky and I wanted to do the Nanny Transitions Workshop in a way, for a way to kick off National Nanny Recognition Week. Now, um, we're so glad you're here. If you're here with us live, we're even happier that you're here, but you know, you can always come back and watch this on the YouTube channel. So, the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about why I do Nanny Transitions and why I created Nanny Transitions. I created Nanny Transitions because when my first job ended, it was devastating. And there really were no resources for me. I mean, I was involved in the industry. I was on the INA board. I was, you know, I was a founder of the National Association of Nannies. I had done workshops. I had done all these things. But there was really nothing solid out there that told me what to do, how to deal with it, explained my emotions to me and what I was going through and made me feel like it was okay to feel the way that I was feeling because I really didn't know what was wrong with me. You know, I didn't know if it was okay for me to feel that way. But the one thing I know that I did was I did a whole lot of things wrong. And so as I went through this, is went through this experience and I went through this transition, um, I had a family that I was hired by them when I first got out of nanny school. One of my favorite things about them, when they took me out to dinner and asked me to come be their child's nanny, they didn't say, will you be, will you come work for us? They said, we want you to come and be part of our family. And they really, they really did treat me like family and it was a wonderful job but over the years you know children grow up and things change and even though they wanted to keep me forever they couldn't keep me forever that wasn't that's not reality and that's the thing that i want you to understand today is that the reality of nanny of nanny jobs is that they end and before I go any further, I'd like to take just a minute and have Becky say hi and have her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Um, I honestly, this is one of my favorite workshops. I've heard it so many times. Every time there's a nugget, some kind of wonderful thing that comes back to me every time. Um, and even though I'm a retired nanny now and I'm doing other things to help support nannies, including working with Glenda on videos like this. Um, there's always something wonderful about it. And I also want to just say that we all know transitions come at an end, but there also can be really difficult transitions in the middle of things. And we'll probably hit on that a few times too, where you're in the middle of a job and things are, and we need to have ways to work through them. And some of these tips are really gonna be super helpful. Thank you, Becky. So the reality is that nanny jobs end. And they end for a lot of reasons. You know, they end because children go to school. Or they end because the partnership starts working. They end for financial reasons. They end because the family moves or they end because the nanny moves. But it doesn't matter how well you do your job, how good you are at it, how much education or how much experience you have nanny jobs end because children grow up and you know what children are supposed to grow up and part of what we're supposed to be doing is teaching children not to need us teaching children to be independent teaching children how to grow up and how to learn and and how to be on their own and you know not everyone understands when you're going through those transitions 
sometimes you can stay through transitions. Sometimes transitions are just as Becky said, they're little bumps in the road that happen along the way. You know, maybe they need to adjust your hours or maybe you need to take on a few more duties that you didn't have before. Maybe you need to do extra things while the children, when the children go to preschool that maybe you didn't do before. Maybe you have to do the grocery shopping or maybe you have to do the errands, you know. Um, those kinds of transitions are sometimes things that we can work through. But because our jobs are always in transition because children are always in transition. Children are always growing and children are always changing. And as children change, our relationships change. But even as we go through all of these changes and all of these emotions, of watching children and being a part of a family with growing children, it's always hard and it's always emotional. So one of the things that I wanna to talk to you about is start the conversation early. When you're interviewing with that family in the very beginning, there are things that you can do to lay the groundwork for how long your job is going to last. And you can, and I you know I always say about, com, about interviewing qu questions is that in the interview process, they're just questions. But once you're hired, there can be issues. So when you were, when you're in an interview, ask the question, how long do you anticipate having a nanny? And if a family says, oh, we're hoping to keep a nanny until our kids go to school at least, then you know, you know you're pretty much on the same page. But if a family says, well, you know, we thought we'd just have somebody here to, you know, be with the baby till he's old enough to go to daycare or he's old enough to go to preschool, or until my mom retires and she can, you know, stay home and take care of him, then you know, this might not be the long-term job that you're looking for. And maybe you don't want a long-term job. But when you have those kinds of conversations in the interview process, it helps you get a better idea of what the family's plan is moving forward. Okay? And sometimes parents make promises that they really mean when they make them. We are going to keep you till our kids go to college. You know, we can build a little house out here in the back for you and you could just live there and, and you could just be there. You could do anything you want to do during the day. You could be, I mean, parents make all kinds of promises. And when they make them, they really mean them. They really do. They mean what they say in the moment. But we can't hold our employers to the promises they make in the good times. Because the times in a nanny job don't last forever. And, it, and sometimes it isn't even that the good times end. It's just that the children grow up and their needs change. So one of the really important things that you have to do as a nanny is you need to have a plan. You need to have a short-term plan and you need to have a long-term plan. If you're a live-in nanny, it's crucial. Because if you're a live-in nanny and your employer comes home from work and says, hey, I lost my job today and we can't keep you and this is your last day. Well, hopefully you have a work agreement and that doesn't happen to you. But I have had it happen to people and I've had phone calls where people said, I just lost my job, what do I do, where do I go? You know, when you're a living nanny, you have to find another place to live. You don't just have to find another job, you have to have find another place to live. So if you're a living nanny, you should have a place that you can go on a short notice. You need to have one person that you can call up and say, hey, I lost my job today. Can I come crash on your couch? You need to have some money saved away in case that happens to you. And if you're a living, whether you're a live in or a live out, you need to have that money in the bank. OK, you really should save at least three months of your salary to live on so that you can get through in between jobs. The other thing that you need is a longer term plan. Somebody that you could go to and say, hey, I'm in between jobs. I'm trying to get another place. Do you think I could crash on your couch for three weeks or two weeks or you know whatever it takes for me to get back on my feet? But you need to have those things in place so that if the inevitable happens, you can go, okay, I know where I can go tonight. 
okay, I know where I can stay for a couple of weeks. Because when you lose your job, it's devastating. And if it ends badly, it's even more devastating. So you need to protect yourself. You need to do the things that you can to protect yourself if the inevitable happens, okay? So the next thing I want to talk to you about is, you know, I don't think that a lot of nannies realize this, but there are very specific signs that your job is coming to an end. And before I get into those, Becky, do you have anything that you want to add about that section I just discussed? I can't really think of anything, but I think that idea of having those plans of action are really important. Um, it just gives you a little peace of mind. It's rattling when somebody says, this is, this is it. Mm -hmm. It's very rattling. So you have that backup so you don't worry. you like, okay, this is not great, but I'm prepared. You don't go into panic mode. mode. A little more centered so you can move forward. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, you know, if you go into panic mode, it's much easier to become angry. Absolutely. And some things, sometimes things happen that our employers have absolutely no control over. There are very specific signs that a job is ending. And over the years, I have asked nannies for these signs and, you know, for feedback on these. And as I've learned more, I add to my workshop on these things. And I wanted to say this earlier, but I'm going to interject it right now. One of the things about doing this workshop, I have learned so much from other nannies from their experiences and what they have gone through and what they have done and what's been done to them. So the signs a job is ending, it's really important to know them, okay? And the number one sign a job is ending. What is the number one sign? It's when you stop communicating. Because communication is absolutely critical. Absolutely. I don't care what relationship it is. I don't care if it's your husband, it's your best friend, if it's your, whoever it is. If you don't have communication, you have nothing. Because communication is the foundation you build a relationship on. And sometimes when you get a job, your communication's great. It starts out and, and it's fine. But sometimes things happen and you just, the parents get busy or you get busy with the kids and you stop communicating. And when you stop communicating, you're not going to be on the same page anymore. You know, um, communication is so important. It's important to communicate about what's happening, what's happening in the family, what's happening with the children, what the plans are, what you're doing, what you're going to do with the kids, where you're going to take the kids. Um, you, you know, you have that ongoing communication, things that you need to communicate about on a per, you know, on an ongoing basis, things like, oh, you know, when the baby's little, you talk about, okay, well, you know, when the baby gets a little older, we're going to need to baby proof. Now I'm a strict believer in baby proofing at like three or four months so that by the time they get to be mobile at six months or so, you're already used to all of the safety, you know, gadgets and you know how to use them and operate them. And you're in the habit of shutting those doors and locking things up. So you have that conversation, you know, who's going to do the baby proofing? Um, are you, am I going to do it? Is someone else going to do it? But those are the kinds of conversations that you have that you start to build that communication. And you should have those, you know, sometimes they'll just be short conversations you have as you're walking out the door or they're walking in the door. But you need to be sure that you are communicating. When the parents stop trying to be respectful or accommodating to your needs, when they start coming home late all the time, or when you say to them specifically, I have a meeting at 7 o'clock on Thursday night, I need to leave 20 minutes early and they come home 20 minutes late. You know, sometimes it's just an oversight, but sometimes it's just a lack of respect. When parents take on responsibilities that used to be yours, sometimes that happens because, 
you know, they might come home and say, oh, you know what, I'm going to take Susie to ballet today. Because when they're five, it's a whole lot easier to come home and take them somewhere than when they're three and you have to pack a snack and you have to pack a change of clothes and you have to do this and you have to do that, right? So, you know, sometimes they take on responsibilities that used to be yours and it's fine. But sometimes when they do that, it's a sign. So you need to be aware of the signs and pay attention to the signs so that you'll see them when they start to happen. When everything's an issue for you, when every time your boss tries to tell you something, you just go, huh. you know, the kids are having too much sugar. You need to stop that. Johnny, do you want a fruit box? And then, you know, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that if the mom wants to give the kid a fruit box, she can. But if she doesn't want you to do it, it's okay. Because she gets to make that decision. Your job is to teach them to be eat healthy and have healthy eating habits. So if the mom doesn't want to abide by that, it's okay. But you really need to talk about those things. And those are just little things, you know, that start to drive a wedge of frustration when you feel like you can't do anything right or when you feel like your employer can't do anything right when everything's an issue for you when the parents don't back you up whenever you've had a conversation about a top of something for example if you say you know I usually let the children come home and watch 10 minutes of TV, 15 minutes of TV before they do their homework. Then we have our snack and then they start on homework. And the mom says, no, those kids have to come home and they have to do their homework as soon as they walk in the door. Then you might have a little conflict there, you know? So you have to work that out. You have to see if you can find a compromise. You have to figure out why the mom feels that way but sometimes when the parent just starts saying this is the way it is my way or the highway that's it's a sign okay if you start to see signs that maybe there's some money issues <laughs> paycheck bounces that's a big one um, if they ask you for the credit cards back or they ask you to limit your credit cards or if they take away the petty cash box those could be signs that they're having money problems. And when they start having money problems, when employers start having money problems, first of all, it's embarrassing to them. And they're not probably not going to be forthright with you about it. But those are signs that you should watch for, okay? Things you should be aware of. If they belittle you in front of the children, or if the children, if, if, you know, mom walks in from work and you've just told Johnny he can't go outside and play because he has to come in and unload the dishwasher. And mom walks in the door and he says, mom, can I come outside and play? And she doesn't ask you if it's okay. You know, that's a little disrespectful. And so, you know, you have to talk about those things. And if they start to just undermine your authority or correct you in front of the children, those are signs. They disagree with everything you say, and especially if they disagree in front of the children. That's a sign. When you start the day and you wish it was already over, and you dread going to work, when your employer avoids you, when you avoid your employer, when the parents stop getting excited about the things you're doing with the children and the activities you've planned for them, when you stop having regular meetings, when they go back on promises they made to you, like if they told you you could have an extra two weeks of vacation this year, and then they come to you and say, oh, you know, we, we know we told you that, but, you know, we're not going to go on three vacations. So, you know, you we're going to be here that week. So you're going to have to work and you've already made plans. And they say, oh, well, you know, that's too bad. That's kind of an unusual concession when you don't get a raise, when you feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time, when the children have outgrown your level of expertise. When, well, this one's kind of funny to me because it's, it's, it's mysterious phone calls or messages. 
But, you know, the fact of the matter is that we don't answer our employer's phones anymore. Very few of our employees have house phones. But 25 years ago when I did Danny Transitions Workshop, you know, everybody answered their employer's phone. So I guess I should probably just X that one off. But and the, the other thing is just a general feeling of something just not being right. Because your gut feeling, your gut is almost always right. So when you start to have these feelings, we'll talk about what to do about that. But Becky, do you have anything to add um, about that? About those? Yeah, I was thinking of something to go with communi with communication. Is that, and then we hear this so often from from nannies we know and we mentor and who are in parts of the groups. Um, is this fear of having a conversation? There's this, oh, how do I say it? What do I say? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if you cannot speak to them and you can't think of how you want to speak to them, we are got, we've gotten to a place where it's really, this is yes. not, you've built this situation and it's mm -hmm. so hard then. Mm -hmm. That just tells me your communication is totally falling apart. If you're afraid to speak up and say something, something's really not right. Right. And that's a great segue into this next thing that I'm going to talk about because if you see those signs when the writing is on the wall, if you are unhappy with your employers, the chances are great that your employers are also unhappy with you. I can't tell you how many nannies I have talked to that have said to me, there's something wrong. I feel it. I've got a gut feeling. I don't know what's going on, but I'm afraid to talk to my employers. And then the next thing they know, they come to me and they say, I just saw my job on care.com. You know? So here's what I'm going to tell you. You are a professional. When you see the writing on the wall, this is your responsibility to go to your employers you take control of the situation, okay? Don't wait, don't wait for someone else to decide what you're gonna do with your life or what they're gonna do with your life. Don't let other people make those decisions for you. If there's a problem, go to your employers and say, we need to have a meeting. Because it's really, I know it sounds scary, but it is the most empowering thing that you can do for yourself to find your voice and stand in your own power and say these things you know this isn't what my work agreement says or this isn't what we agreed to this you know how can we fix this is this fixable and a lot of times you're in, that will be the time that your employer will say to you well you know we've been taught we've been meaning to talk to you we don't think certain things are working out or the kids are going to be going to school in the fall or my job just got cut down to three days a week you know there's all different kinds of scenarios there okay sometimes you can fix these issues sometimes your employer might say oh i've just been so preoccupied at work and i'm just i'm sorry it's just the wheel that you know the wheel that doesn't squeak doesn't get the grease and you just do such a beautiful job that i just lost track and and that can happen you know but take control take control and be prepared and prepare yourself that you may not hear what you want to hear your job may be ending but it might be fixable but you are the one that took control. You made the decision to try and do something about it. You made the decision for yourself instead of letting someone else make it for you. Don't let somebody else make that decision for you. When you see those signs on the wall, read them, heed them, pay attention. I'm telling you girls, it is happening, okay? I'm sorry, this guy's here too, I'm sure. I'm, I apologize for that. But I'm telling you that those signs are not nothing. Those signs are huge. Pay attention to them, okay? So the next thing I want to talk about is so that once you get to that point, you either you know resolve the situation and go on status quo, or you make a decision that 
you know, your job's going to end and you're going to be moving on. And you and your employers can talk about that and work that out. And the other thing I want to interject here really quickly is sometimes you can fix those things, but sometimes it's also just a short-term fix, okay? Especially if the kids are getting older. Sometimes it's just a short-term fix. And that's okay because you fixed it. And it's great practice. Communication is just, it's so important to know how to communicate. And the more you communicate, the better you get at it. The sooner you learn to stand in your own power and find your voice. And believe me, it took me a long time to stand in my own power and find my voice. But once you do it, it changes everything. And the other thing that happens when you stand in your own power is that if, if whether it's an employer, whether it's a friend, it's a boyfriend, it's a it, whatever works, whatever situation it is, when you teach people that you have a voice and that you can stand in your own power, they respect you. They don't push your limits anymore because they know they can't. And it really makes a difference because people like to push you as far as they can. They do. They really do. So, Becky, do you have anything to add to that before I move on to how to prepare the children? We are our own best advocate. That's right. You know, waiting for someone else to take care of it is not going to be helpful. And you know what? We do such a good job with children. We prepare them for being assertive, for being able to speak up for themselves, for being their own person. Then we should be listening to our own advice. That's right. Yep, that's right. And, you know, as nannies, so many times we just put ourselves last and we put our feelings last. And part of that is because we love the kids and we don't want to leave the kids. And so we just pretend that we can fix it. And I'll get into this a little later, but that is denial. And that's the first stage of grief. And that is how you know your job's ending. Okay. That's how you know you're supposed to, you need to leave. So once you and your employer you and your employer have had a conversation and you have decided that your job is going to end and when it's going to end, it's a tough time because everybody's feeling emotional. So what's really, really important right now is to focus on how you prepare the children, to focus on the children and how you're going to tell them and what you're going to tell them. And who's going to be present when you tell them? And that's so important because as frustrating as it is, the truth is the parent has the right to decide whether or not you will be allowed to be there when they tell the children. And you have to respect their right as the parent to make that decision. And you might not like it. But you have to respect the right of the parent to make that decision. And that can be the first thing that just, you know, of many that's going to happen as things get tense. Because sometimes these last few weeks and days can be tense. So the first thing I want to talk about when we talk about how to prepare the children is I want to talk about how younger children have no concept of time. So if you have a toddler up to a two-year-old, even if you've been with them from birth, they will remember the love you gave them. They will remember the nurturing and the safe space that they found with you. But if you come back in a year, they may not look at you and go, oh, Danny. They just might not remember you. They don't have that memory yet, okay? And just don't be insulted by that because they just haven't developed that far yet. If you have like, like, because I think that, you know, if you think about what your earliest memory was, I'd say my earliest memory is somewhere around three. What would you say yours was, Becky? Yeah, I, I can remember things that are happened when I was three. Yeah, around three. And, you know, when kids get to be three, they begin to have a little bit of a concept of time, like one more sleep, and mommy will, you know, go home or one more sleep and that's the day we go to the zoo. But they don't have a great concept of time. And for that reason, you don't want to give kids that are like 
three to six, you don't want to give them a three month notice. You want to give them maybe two weeks because to them, they don't know what a week is. I mean, a week could be seven years. A week could be five minutes. They don't have the same concept and understanding of time that we do. So you really need to keep that in mind when you make the decision about when you're going to tell the children. You need to keep their age in mind. If they're a little bit older, then, you know, you can give them four weeks if you want to. So I would take two weeks with preschool, three to, you know, three to six. And, you know, if you want to give them uh, three or four weeks with older kids, I think that's okay as long as you have a plan, you know. Um, you say, okay, this week we're going to do this, and this week we're going to do this, so that it's not just, oh, three more weeks, oh, two more weeks. You know, you've got to you, you've got to build up to it, okay? So I'd even backtrack a little bit and say three weeks is plenty for older kids, okay? Just don't give them too much time. You want time and you need time, but don't give them too much time. You know, one thing you can do with older kids, especially, or even younger kids even, is make a photo album. And you don't have to say to them, I'm leaving, so let's make a photo album. You could just say, hey, you know what would be really fun? Let's make an album of all the fun things that we've done together and talk about those things and laugh about those things. And, you know, create, help them remember and, and let them have input on what picture they want to put and what they want to say about that picture. And then send it off to like Snapfish and, and have, you know, make one for them. Make it up for them. Make one for yourself because you're going to need it too. Okay. But there, you know, be aware as you, as you tell the children, as you prepare them, be aware. Educate children from the day you start caring for them, that you are there, that you are, that you love them, that you will always love them, and they'll always, that you will not always be there on a daily basis. They need to understand that you're there to do a job, and when your job is finished, you move on. And it's not their fault, and it's not anything that they did wrong. It's just a natural process of what we do. And we need to teach them that in a positive way and in a loving and caring, compassionate way. If you're going to still see them, if you want to still see them, make sure that they know that. If you've talked to the parents about that and you, and you want to still see them, make sure that they know that. And as you're talking to the parents about how things are going to go moving forward, you really need to take that opportunity to make that decision together. You know, if you want to continue to see the children, if you want to have play dates, if you want to babysit, when you're doing these final preparations for the, you know, transition, that's when you have that conversation with the family. Because as time goes on and things get harder towards the end, it's harder to have those conversations. And then once you're out the door, it's almost impossible to go back and say, oh, you know, I never told you I still want to see your kids. Oh, I never told you that I want to have play dates with your kids. Oh, I never told you that I want to babysit sometimes. So that, you know, as soon as you know you're leaving, say those things to them. Hey, you know, if it's if it's possible, I'd love to babysit sometimes. I'd love to have play dates with the kids. And then you have to decide how you want to handle those situations. Like, if you're going to have play dates, does that mean you're going to be on the clock? Personally, I never charged for play dates. I would have paid my employers to let me see their kids. But I think if you're baby, if they ask you to babysit, it's different. If they say, "Can you watch them on Saturday night?" then that's different. But those are actually that's part of the conversation that you can have. As you're working to prepare the children, those are things that you need to think about and things you need to talk about And before you get to the last day, okay? So if you're going to still be able to see them, make sure that they know that. You might give them a calendar and you might put, like if you might set up before your last day, you might set up a play date 
this is when we're going to see each other again. And you might also set up a calendar that's like, you know, if it's two weeks before you leave, set up a calendar on the activities that you're going to do each day and what your last day is going to be. And then again, when you're going to see them again, if you're going to see them again, because children are visual and it helps them. They can hold that calendar. They can look at that calendar. They can point to that date and they can say, oh, that's the day I'm going to see my nanny again. Oh, this is the day we're going to do this. This is the day we're going to do that. So, and, and it's going to help you too, because you're going to have a better idea of how things are going to go. Okay. So if they're moving away, you can leave them your picture, your new phone number, your email address, a way to get in touch with you. Um, you, know, you can talk to the parents about maybe Skyping with the kids or reading to the kids sometimes on Skype or not Skype, Zoom or, you know, whatever. And I know a lot of people do is FaceTime. I don't do FaceTime, but a lot of people do FaceTime. So there are a lot of different avenues of communication that you can use. Even if the kids are going to be away, far away, there's still things you can do. Okay. Um, you talked about making the picture album. You could give them certificates that show how much they've grown. You could point out things. Um, a friend of mine gave her kids certificates that talked about all the things that they had learned and all the ways that they had grown. And then she also, which I loved this, she also pointed out their strengths. You know, you've got such a kind heart. You always think of other people. You have the best ideas. And I thought that was just incredible. I thought that was so good. And I'm going to kind of interject this here. You know, one of the things that I want you to remember when you're preparing the children is that you have given them all the tools that they need to get through this. You have been teaching them all this time you've been with them. You have been loving them. You have been teaching them to be kind. You've been teaching, teaching them to be understanding and good brothers and good sisters and good citizens and good students. And, you know, you're, you've been teaching them. They're not going to forget those things when you're gone. Okay. They're not going to forget those things. But sometimes we need to remind them of what those strengths are. And especially when they get sad to say to them, you know, do you remember the time that this happened and you did that? See, you're really strong. You're really smart. You can really figure things out. Because one of the things that I think about whenever I talk to nannies and on my nanny transitions group, especially nannies talk about the last day. And, you know, we put so much emphasis on the last day with our kids. But this one I want you to remember. The last day isn't the most important day you're going to spend with those kids. The most important day you spent with those kids was every day that came before the last day. The day you learned, you taught them how to ride a two-wheeler. The day they learned to whistle. The time you read them the same book 20 times because it was their favorite book. The time you sat through the, the Wizard of Oz 14 times, even though it ends the same way every time. You know, those were the days that you built a life. Those were the days that you showed your love. Those were the days that, you know, you helped build a good person. And you got to remember that, that the last days are important, but the best days and the most important days are all the other days that came before that. You know, if you can transition with a new nanny, you should try and do that. If your kids can see that you're having a positive relationship with the new nanny that's coming in to take care of them, that's going to make such a difference for them. If you could say to them, did you know that Miss Sarah can do a cartwheel? Can you believe it? Maybe she'll teach you how to do a cartwheel. Because, you know, I could never do a cartwheel. But if you teach them that you're accepting that person, that's going to give them permission to accept her too. Okay. You can talk if their mom's going to be staying at home. You can talk about all the fun things that their mom's going to do with them. If it's whether it's the mom or the new nanny, if there are special traditions that the kids love, 
you could share those with them. But, you know, try to make this a positive experience for them. And the other thing is, you know, you should never promise your kids you're going to stay forever. Because it's just not true. Even if you think you are, it's just not true. Another thing is that if you have former charges that you still keep in touch with, you know, talk about them. You know, if, you, if they say, you know, if you go to the park and you say, oh, you know what, when I was Joey's nanny, we used to come to this park and her favorite thing was the swing. You know, then they understand that you didn't just leave her. You moved on, but you didn't leave her. You still think about her. You still talk about her. She's still part of your life, you know? And kids need to know that. And believe me, kids are paying attention, okay? Make an extra effort to, mem to recognize their birthdays and holidays. Send them cards. Cards are very exciting for kids to get in the mail, you know? Um, it's just, it's so exciting. If you, I mean, it's exciting for me to get cards in the mail. Becky Cavanaugh sends me cards. I love when Becky Cavanaugh sends me cards. It makes me so happy. You can talk about great memories. You can have a special uh, picture made together. But, you know, I just want you to remember that you're the adult in this situation. And you need to stay on the high road. And it's not easy. And it's not fun. But this, this, is, this is the important part. Because one of the most important lessons that you're teaching a child as you're saying goodbye, is you're teaching them how to say goodbye. You know, life's a series of goodbyes. People are constantly coming and going in our lives. And knowing how to say goodbye in a positive way is an important lesson. It's the last best lesson that we teach our kids. So before I move on to grief, Becky, do you, you want to add anything to that? Becky. I think that I was going to say, I just think that you've touched on it so much. We teach them lessons all the time. We teach children lessons all the time. And they are watching how we handle ourselves in a lot of situations. This is just one of those lessons that will serve them very, very well in the future. Mm -hmm. So right. keeping and that in your mind. Them all yeah. Yeah. If you're keeping that in your mind, then I think that you can pull yourself together. Mm -hmm. No matter how painful it is, you yeah. can do it. Yes. Because you're the adult. And and you know, this isn't easy. It isn't easy. And the next thing that I want to talk about will kind of play it plays into that. And we're going to talk about our emotions, okay? This is what I want you to know. Whatever you are feeling is okay, and it's normal. You have loved someone else's child. You have diapered them. You have cared for them. You have loved them. You have rocked them when they're sick. You've changed their poopy diapers. You have nurtured them. You have taught them. You've seen their first steps. You you know, you are a huge part of who they are. And honestly, you own stories that belong to them that if you don't tell them, they will never know. You know? And so you matter. But this is hard. And you're going to go through a lot of emotions. And you're going to feel betrayed. And you're going to feel hurt. And you're going to feel angry. But I'm going to beg you to hear this. Stay on the high road. You are a professional, and you should be prepared for this. And that's what this workshop is all about, is for preparing you for this hard goodbye so that you will know what your emotions are going to be, so that you will understand, so that you will be okay feeling your emotions and working through your emotions so that you can move forward to another job instead of, quitting the industry and not coming back because when I left my first nanny job I left the industry and boy was that a mistake but 
After I was miserable in another job for six months, I realized how much I love being a nanny. And I came back and I never left again. And I used all those lessons to learn this, to do this, because this is what I do now. This is my gift to you. The Nanny Transitions Workshop is my gift to the nanny industry. It's a gift to every nanny out there. So now we're going to talk about grief because you are grieving the loss of a child and you will grieve the loss of that child like a death. You know, someone doesn't have to die for you to grieve. And the first stage of grief is denial. And the first stage of grief begins when you start to see the writing on the wall and you ignore it. And you just go, eh, it's okay. I love these kids and I'm not going to rock the boat and I'm just going to stay a little longer. But then when your employers come to you and say your job's ending because you didn't take the bull by the horns and stand in your own power and use your voice, then you get angry and you go. After everything I have done for this family, I can't believe they would treat me like this. They told me I was going to stay here till those kids went to college. And they lied to me. They lied to me. They're just liars. I should never have trusted them. And you're just going to work yourself up into a frenzy. And then, after you do that, you're going to go, oh, you know, if I could, maybe, maybe I could just work this out. I mean, maybe if I just, if I just don't deal with the parents and I just come to work and I just be with the kids and, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be okay. Maybe I should just go back and talk to them and see if I could just keep my job and we could just work that out. Or maybe, maybe I could take a pay cut. I could take a pay cut. Maybe I could take a pay cut and, and maybe I could get another job. And, you know, you do all these kinds of, of bargaining things, but eventually you realize that your job is really ending and you have to move on and then you get depressed because you're sad and you're mad and you're angry and you're frustrated and you don't have a job and you know that you have to start looking for another job but you just don't have the energy to do it and you do that for a while you know can't make important decisions. You can't accept the job's ending. But eventually, when the bills have to be paid and there's no money in the bank to pay them, you have to start thinking about what to do next. And sometimes, even when a job ends on a positive note, it's still hard to start moving forward because change is hard. And it's hard to change jobs. You know, and, and sometimes... You have to change your place to live. You, you know, you gotta, you gotta get to know a new family. You gotta know their, get to know their traditions. You got to, to get to know their house rules. And, you know, can you wear your shoes in the house? Can you drive their kids in the car? Can you go on outings? Can you have playdates? And it's just exhausting. It's all exhausting to try to start over again. And how do you just? Sock away all those feelings of having those kids just be your world for all those years and then just nothing. How do you do that? How do you deal with that? But you know, grieving is a process that you have to deal with on your own terms. It helps to have a good support system in place, and I hope you do have a good support system in place. And if you don't have a good support system in place, Reach out to me and I'll help you get a support system, okay? You've got to have a support system. I'm telling you, Becky Kavanaugh, she is my support system. You know, Anita Langari, Kelly Gears, those Michelle Rowe, they're all my support systems. They are nannies. There are Marnie Kent. There's hundreds of nannies out there that are just they're always there for me, you know? And you need that. You need that. You need that support. So find your network. Find people who understand and even if they don't understand find people who will let you grieve and let you be in your grief because you have to grieve to get through it you can't get over it you can't get under it you can't get around it you have to go straight through grief you have to go through every stage of grief 
because if you've ever driven a shift stick shift car, you can't go from first to third. Believe me, you can't. Well, you can, but it isn't pretty. But if you go from first to second to third to fourth, then you can go somewhere. Then you can move forward. But the other thing is that sometimes you do have to go back to second. You do have to go back to first because grief is a zigzag. And sometimes just when you think you're through it, you hear a song or you read a book or you have smell a smell and you're just right back where you were and you're just a puddle on the floor again. And that's grief, you know? And one of the things you might be grieving is your relationship with those parents. Because sometimes when a job ends, the first thing that you want those employers to say is, we don't know what we would do without you. Oh, we, what are we going to do without you? Oh my gosh, you're so amazing. And we just, we, we, don't, we just don't know what we're going to do without you. We just love you so much. And you know what you usually get? You usually get radio silence. Nothing. They never say a word. They just go on about their business, go to work every day, come home every day. You know, business as usual, except that you're losing your job. But let me tell you something really important. This is not the time that those parents are going to come to you and say those things to you. Because number one, they don't miss you. You're still there, okay? And number two, they are trying to send their children a very clear message that they are going to be okay, that they're going to be there to love them and take care of them, and that even though you're not going to be there, you are not going to be there anymore. They will always be there to love their children and take care of their children. And you know what? That is their job. Your job is finished, but their job never ends. And so you need to support that the best you can and not take that personal because if you stay on good terms with them, chances are they're going to come back and tell you how much they missed you and how they have a hard time without you. But you know, you've got to give them some grace. They didn't hire you with a thought of, well, you know, let's hire this nanny, let her fall in love with our kids, and then after about four years, we'll just kick her to the curb. Yeah, she'd get over it. We'll just find somebody else. That isn't what parents do. It isn't how they go into this. This isn't the mindset that they were in whenever they hired you. And nothing that they ever said to you was a lie. They did love you. They did care about you. They did want you to be part of their family. They do love the way you care for their children. It's just not realistic for your job to last forever because nanny jobs just don't. And even if they want to kid themselves sometimes into thinking that they could make it last forever, that usually doesn't happen. And it's not their fault. And it's not their fault that their children grew up. So you need to give them some grace. And the other thing that I want to talk about just a minute is about how, you know, that last day when you're telling those kids goodbye and you're thinking about all the days that came before and all the important days that came before. I also want you to remember all the good things that your employer did for you. All the times that they called and said, it's okay if you're sick, you can stay home another day. Stay home and get well. Don't worry about coming to work. We'll take care of it. About the time your grandma died and they said, just go ahead and go and take off and take off those, you know, take off the weekend, come back on Monday if you need to. Just do what you need to do. Well, we, we've, we've got you covered. Think about the times that they were there for you. Think about all the times that they did show you that appreciation. Because this isn't the time. It's just not. It's just not the time to do it. Maybe on the last day they do step up. But sometimes parents don't. Because sometimes parents just aren't very good at this. Which is one more reason why you need to take control. And you need to make the decisions about what is going to happen in your life. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about the stages of recovery from grief. Because they're overlapping. You know, there's shock, denial, and numbness, and then there's fear and anger and depression, and then there's understanding and acceptance, and then there's moving on. And they take time. They're necessary, they're natural, and they're part of the healing process. 
But once I've said that, I need to say this. If you get stuck, if you need help, don't hesitate to get it. If you feel su suicidal, if you think you might be feeling suicidal, call the prevention hotline. Reach out to someone at once. If you feel like you're coming apart, if you feel like you're not in control, if you have a history of alcohol abuse or drug abuse, you know, sometimes we all need just a little bit of help to get through this hard chapter. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help. If it's a lot of help or a little help, just don't hesitate to ask for help, okay? And now I want to talk about moving forward. Avoid the blame game. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame your employers. It's not productive. It's not healthy. And it doesn't solve anything. Don't try to figure out why it happened or how it happened or what you could have done to fix it because nanny jobs end. Don't try to keep a stiff upper lip. If you're sad, be sad. Feel it. Own your emotions. Leaving a family hurts. So feel the feels. But then move on. You know, move forward with your life. Make a plan. Think about what you want your next job to be. What you want your next job to be like, be like. What kind of family do you want to work for in your next job? What's your dream job? You know, write, write all of those things down. Figure out what you need to do and break it down into small tasks. Going out and finding a new job tomorrow, that feels kind of overwhelming. But if you could start with something small, find and update your resume. You know, Becky has a business where she helps people with their resumes, but the other thing that she does for Nannies in Transition is if you send her your resume, she will look at it and she will give you suggestions for how to improve it. And if you do the work, and, and she'll tell you what to do. And if you do that work yourself, she doesn't charge you for that. Now, if you say to her, well, will you fix that for me, then she will charge you. But out of the goodness of her heart and the love for the industry and her compassion and her commitment to nannies in transition, she get, offers this service, which is an incredible service. And I know lots and lots of nannies were like, oh, my gosh, I paid for so much more. I've paid for more than this, you know. She, it's an incredible service that she offers, and um, we'll be sharing her website this week on the Facebook page. Um, yeah, we'll be doing that. But um, yeah, she you know she offers that. So reach out to her and say, hey, will you look at my resume and let me know what it needs? And you know, start with something small. That's a great place to start because you can't begin to look until you have a resume. Make sure your references are up to date. Let them know you're looking for an employ employment and be sure that they know, make sure that it's okay if people call you. Make sure that their phone numbers are still current. But you're only going to get through this one step at a time, okay? One step at a time, one day at a time, one hour at a time, sometimes just one minute at a time. But try to do at least one positive thing towards your job search every day. And find support. Try to find a nanny group online, like we have the Nanny Transitions Facebook group. We love to have you. We support each other. We encourage each other. And we help each other through it. But take care of you. Take care of yourself. Take care of your health. Maybe you can't afford to go out and buy new clothes or Go to get your nails done, but go buy a new bottle of nail polish or go buy a new lipstick. And because sometimes the little things are just as important as the big things, you know, eat healthy. Don't use this time to binge or abuse alcohol. Just take care of yourself. Okay. Try to learn something from this experience. I mean, instead of just going... They just didn't treat me right. That just wasn't right. Be objective about it. Sit down and go, you know what? What What? What could I maybe do different 
next time that I didn't do this time. And maybe it's as simple as, you know what? I didn't have a work agreement and I really needed a work agreement. Or maybe it was, oh, they were paying me under the table. Because, you know, once an employer pays you under the table, they stop viewing you as a professional and they stop treating you as a professional. If you want to be a professional and you want to be treated as a professional, you have to act like a professional. You have to do all the professional things. And that's what this workshop's all about is, you know, you are the professional. Parents suck at these goodbyes. They're terrible at them. But now you know how to do it. Now you know what to do and now you know how to do it and you know how to do it right. And you can teach them and you can teach the parents, you know, this is how you do it. This is the right way to do it. And as you teach the parents, you're going to teach the children too. Becky, do you have something to add to that? I think that I, I want to add, it's so easy to be angry. Understand that there's a feeling that certainly you can have if you want to, but when you harbor those angry feelings and you just can't move past them, it's they just hound you. We know so many people who have had a very traumatic transition of some kind. They've been angry, they've harbored those bad feelings, and it followed them into the next job and into the next job and they until they can let go of it and really repair themselves because honestly it's hurting you not anybody else they just can't get over it so i you've said so many times glenda how we need to take care of ourselves how we need to be thinking to move forward those harboring those bad feelings and having those negative feelings do nothing for do not moving forward or hurt or helping ourselves at all. That's right. Well, I'm going to give you some tips for leaving a family as I close this out. And um, I think these are really important. We've talked about trying to keep in touch with them taking time for yourself to re-energize and clear your head, take time off between jobs if you can. Um, we've talked about making sure you'll always love them, make, making sure they know you'll always love them, and um, maintaining your professionalism. And, you know, going back to what Becky was just talking about, Becky and I actually have a workshop. It's called the F Word, and it's about forgiveness. And um, if you get Matt and Nanny magazine, you probably read about it in your in the summer issue. Um, we had an article in there about it, but we also have a workshop, and we will that will be one of the workshops that we'll be doing here on Nanny Transitions. Um, but a good nanny always works herself out of a job. And I want to leave you with some final thoughts, okay? I want you to remember that recovery from grief is a zigzag and you're going to have good days and bad days and that's okay. But you need to let go of your pain and your anger. And you need to believe that what's happened is meant to be and that there's another wonderful family just waiting for you to come. When you start to interview again, don't compare. No two families can be compared to each other. And you're really setting yourself up for failure if you do that. It's not fair to anybody if you do that. Don't hold back on your love. Just because your job ended doesn't mean don't hold back from the next kids. Because I think that if you hold back, you're the one that misses out. You know, you're the one that misses out. To love something that when you lose it, it hurts so bad. That's, a, that's an incredible love. And we do miss out if we hold back. The roots of love sink down deep and strike out far, and they are arteries that feed our lives. So we see that they get the water and sun they need so they can nourish us. And when you put something back good into the world, something good comes back to you. So the final thing I want to talk about 
if you don't remember anything else I said today, love looks forward. Always love look always looks forward. And you can't move forward when you're always looking back. If you're always looking back how somebody did you wrong or how somebody mistreated you or how that employer didn't treat you right, you're not doing yourself any favors because dragging the past behind you is heavy. And if you are always looking backwards, you can't move forward. I mean, have you ever tried to walk backwards across a room? You bump into things and you stub your toe and, you know, you just can't get there as fast as if you turn around and you just move. And that's the same way with leaving a job. Move forward and move forward in forgiveness and move forward in love. Learn from your experience and move on. Always be a professional. And always take the high road. Always. It's the only way to successfully and peacefully leave a job. Anything else, Becky? No, but I'm going to say, I just, of all the nannies listening who are getting a lot out of this, who've gotten a lot out of this, who are going to take that in and work it through. Thank you so much for doing this. This is so helpful. Once again, a gem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming this evening. I'm glad you're here. We hope this was helpful. We hope this is something that you can tuck away in your heart. Um, and it'll be on the YouTube channel for future reference. You can share it with people and, you know, send us ideas if you have ideas. But we do have a lot of really great videos that we're going to be sharing with you too. Okay. All right. Have a great National Nanny Recognition Week. This was a great way to kick it off. Yes, it was. Okay. Bye.